Primary Election Day in Florida is just four weeks away. It's time to meet the candidates. This original program is provided as a public service by WSRE, the League of Women Voters, and Pensacola State College. Good evening and welcome to Rally 2016. I'm Molly Barrows with WSRE TV. And I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. Tonight is the second of three nights of Rally 2016. Election coverage on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Rally allows you the opportunity to meet the candidates in primary races in Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as well as candidates in the state races that impact these counties. The spotlight tonight is on the race for Florida Senate District 1 and the race for Florida House District 4. Both those districts cover parts of Okaloosa County. Then we'll focus on local races in Okaloosa County, where we'll begin with the race for County Commission District 1, then move on to the races for Sheriff, Property Appraiser, Superintendent of Schools, and School Board Districts 2 and 4. On Thursday, we will cover five primary races in Escambia County for County Commission Districts 1 and 5, Tax Collector, School Board, District 1, and Sheriff. Now the questions that will be put before the candidates this evening were provided to us by the League of Women Voters from the Pensacola Bay Area as well as Okaloosa County. The candidates have not seen the questions. They will each be asked the same questions and they will have 45 seconds to respond. And following the question and answer session, each candidate will have an additional 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement. And it is time to get started. We begin with the race for Florida Senate District 1. Again, that covers parts of Okaloosa County, as well as Walton, Holmes, Washington, Bay, and Jackson counties. There are two candidates in this state race. Both are Republican. In alphabetical order, they are Mr. Doug Broxson, who resides in Gulf Breeze, and Mr. Mike Hill of Pensacola Beach. Welcome to both of you. And let's begin with the questions, starting with Mr. Broxson. The federal government estimates 300,000 people died from gun violence between 2004 and 2014. What is your position on banning all sales of assault weapons and or high capacity magazines? Well, my position is that people that uh, legally own guns should have the right to have those guns. Uh, as you look at the numbers, and you probably are not quoting the statistics, that people that belong to the NRA or have a concealed weapons license are some of the safest people in our society. They're not the problem. The problem is people that are unlicensed and have illegal guns that are doing the violence. So my position is very clear. People, because of the Second Amendment, gives them that right. It's without dispute. They have a right to bear and use arms in a safe, manner. All right, thank you, Mr. Broxson. Mr. Hill, turning now to you again, the federal government estimating 300,000 people died from gun violence between 2004, 2014. What is your position on banning all sales of assault weapons and high capacity magazines? I would be completely against that. We have an inalienable right, a God given right that was codified in our constitution by the second amendment to be able to defend ourselves and protect ourselves and our family and our property. I think that uh, in order for us to be able to do that, we should be able to uh, possess the weapons that we feel we are comfortable with, that you have been trained to use, that we should not need government approval at all in order to defend ourselves against those who might commit a crime against us. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. This next question will go to you first. Over 500,000 working poor Florida citizens remain without health insurance. Would you support tapping federal dollars to cover these people? If not, what kind of plan do you support? If you're referring to expanding Obamacare Medicaid in Florida, I am completely against that. In fact, uh, that came before the legislature last year. The Florida House voted against that for a couple of reasons. Number one, we simply can't afford it. It becomes too costly for us. Right now, health care is a third of our budget in the state. And over a third of that, 37%, is Medicaid. Just 10 years ago, it was only 20%. That's a trajectory that we cannot afford to continue. 
Um, how we should do it instead is to make sure that we have competition in our healthcare system to allow people to choose the doctors and hospitals that they prefer. All right, thank you. And Mr. Broxson, this question to you now over half a million working poor Floridians remain without health insurance. Would you support tapping federal dollars to cover these people? And if not, what kind of plan would you support? Well, we're already tapping federal dollars. They spend 60 cents on every dollar that we spend for Medicaid. And now the burden is so great for the citizens of this state that it is tapping into our money for education, roads, and all the things that give us a quality of life. I wish we could solve all the health care problems, but we simply cannot. And we do have a safety net. Uh, our, by, constitutionally, you can go to the emergency room, you can see a doctor there, and we will continue to provide that. And that's one of the major expenses that we go through every year is making sure our safety net hospitals are properly funded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boxen. And we turn now to question number three. We start with you with this question. Due to rising sea levels, Florida's risk of flooding along the coastlines, especially in some parts, is greatly impacted. What's your opinion about the current resources dedicated to this issue in the state and what actions will you take to further address it? Well, in some parts of the state where we allow construction is a big problem. Uh, I live close to the water and I have not noticed that there's been a considerable sea rise. There are construction areas around the state that when they were built, they knew they would be a problem. And, and frankly, that's of, of great concern to the people that live in the interior part of the state is why should they be subsidizing people that build too close to the water and not high enough to protect themselves. So I, I think we have a flood insurance program that takes care of most of this, but we have got to do a better job of making sure that we build higher and further back from the coastline. All right, thank you, Mr. Broxson. Mr. Hill, question now goes to you. Uh, what in your opinion, uh, what, what, uh, excuse me, what is your opinion about the current resources dedicated to the issue in the state and what actions will you take to further address this issue of uh, Florida's increased risk of flooding along the coastline? Well, first of all, I reject the premise of the question, which goes back to this uh, false narrative of climate change and that it is causing our sea levels to rise. There is no evidence of that at all happening. In fact, um, living along the coastline myself, I do not see sea levels rising. I don't think anyone else sees it. There are occasions where there will be flooding that happens. Uh, this is a rare occurrence from either rains or perhaps uh, those along the coastline, as Representative Broxton said, have built too close to the, the beach or to the waterline. But there is no rising sea level at this time. Um, we should instead direct our resources towards education and those things that really matter. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. All right, our next question will go to Mr. Broxton first. A Human Rights Watch report found that 12,000 children over a five-year period were transferred to adult court. I'm sorry, it is to you first, Mr. Hill. Thank you very much. Um, I'll begin again. A Human Rights Watch report found that 12,000 children over a five-year period were transferred to adult court. Florida law allows the prosecutor to transfer a child to adult court without a hearing or input from a judge. What would you do to change this system? First of all, what we need to look at is to back up and look at what is causing this problem of uh, crimes being committed by our youth. And I say it's the breakdown of the family unit. We need to instead strengthen our families. We need to have a man and a woman raising their children in a way they should go. And when they grow old, they won't depart from it so that we don't they don't become a burden on society. Instead, what we should do is strengthen the family, strengthen those values that keep families together. We know in a household where there is a man and a woman raising a child that the incidence of crime being uh, committed by those children is greatly diminished. That's the real answer. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. And now to you, Mr. Broxson. What is, uh, given that Florida law allows the prosecutor to transfer a child to adult court without a hearing, uh, or input from a judge, what would you do to change this system? Well, I believe in the system. I believe that prosecutors and state attorneys and public defenders are elected by the people. 
And they are, in, in most parts, and I've talked to many of them, they're very sensitive to the situation when it involves a juvenile. However, at the same uh, time, there is a tremendous burden on our judicial system right now, uh, especially with teenagers and younger people. So we have to depend on our public defenders and prosecutors to do the right thing and to put these people that, even though they're youth, in a place where they can be properly adjudicated and dealt with at that level. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Broxton, our next question, we begin with you. Florida uses a closed primary election system, meaning that a voter must be registered as a Republican or a Democrat to vote in a primary. What's your position on changing from the closed primary system to one where no party affiliated voters can participate? I like the system as it is. If you want to be a Republican, you can register as a Repu Republican. If you want to be a Democrat, and in fact, even between the primaries, you could change back and forth. If people want to be involved in this race, if they're Democrats or independents, they could qualify to, to vote in this race. So we have a system, we work on it every year to make sure it's fair, but you really do not want people that do not have a core value of what you believe participating in your race unless they are people that believe in your values. And Republicans have certain things they believe in, Democrats have certain things they believe in, I believe the separation is good. All right, thank you, Mr. Brox and Mr. Hill. We turn now to you for the same question. What's your position on changing from the closed primary system to one that no party affiliated voters can participate in? Well, we know that one of the largest voting blocks that is growing in our nation right now are the independent voters. The independent voters, I believe, do share our values. I think it should be an open primary. We shouldn't disenfranchise more than half of our uh, voting population with a closed primary. And in fact, I, our primary was open between Representative Broxson and I until at the 11th hour, he was able to get someone to do a write-in which closed the primary. So of course he would be for that, but I was completely against it because it disenfranchised so many people and those who are even willing to vote with our conservative values. All right, Mr. Broxson would like uh, to rebut that. You have 30 seconds. Well, I think we have two write-in candidates. And to say that I was involved in that would be a misstatement. I'd have to direct the question back to Mr. Hill. Did you get a write-in candidate in your race? All right, thank you, Mr. Broxson. All right, moving to our next question. It will go first to you, Mr. Hill. In a routine sampling of one area of voucher scholarships, Florida State Education auditors found that more than $1 million were given to students who did not qualify for the money. How will you make sure these private contractors comply with established regulations? Whenever you have a program in place, whether it's for vouchers or for anything else, uh, it, it needs to be transparent, it needs to be accountable, which means that you need to audit it on a regular basis. Um, I think vouchers are an excellent program to be able to allow children to go to schools of their choice that their parents choose. In fact, I was proud to be a part of the legislation this past session, which passed that said that as long as there is room in another district or at that school, a child can go to any school that they want to in the state of Florida. And I think a voucher system to help those who need to go to perhaps the private schools or other is a really good thing to do, and we should keep it in place. All right, thank you. This question now to you, Mr. Broxson. How will you make sure that private contractors comply with established regulations regarding the funding of voucher scholarships? You know, when you start quoting stats in Florida, you have to be real careful who you're talking about. If you look at some of the big problems that occur in the state of Florida, it's not in the panhandle. It's in the southern part of the state. We have massive fraud problems in many, many areas. The state's doing all they can to make sure that we validate those qualified candidates. But even at that, there are people that find a way to game the system. And luckily, we are not the ones that are having the problems. It's the people in the southern part, the southern counties, the tip counties around the, the uh, Tampa and the other areas because there is just too many problems that they cannot take care of because of the, the, uh, the complexity complexity of uh, problems. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Broxson. And our next question, we begin with you. What additional steps, if any, should the legislature take to safeguard the military presence in the state? 
Well, that, that is a phenomenal question, and I'm proud to say that I've been on the Veterans Affairs Committee for four years, and two years ago, we passed the most aggressive pro-veteran, pro both active and non-active, retired in the state. And we're gonna to continue to do that. We want people that have been trained by the military, that ha the, the government has spent thousands and thousands of dollars to train them to stay here and be part of our community. I believe in that and I, I will continue to work to make sure that we make it possible for people to not only stay here and live here, but to have good paying jobs. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Bronx and Mr. Hill. Same question now to you. What additional steps, if any, should the legislature take to safeguard the military presence in our state? Well, as a graduate of the Air Force Academy and spending 10 years active duty, I understand the military situation in our area. I have requested and received briefings from the commander of Pensacola NAS, commander at Whiting Field, and also the commander at uh, Hurlburt Air Force Base, their cyber, cyber security. An additional step we should take, because this is such a uh, large military presence, is to make sure that we stop refugee resettlement from happening in this area. I think that is a direct threat, that we do not give Florida driver's license to illegal aliens, as Representative Broxson voted to do. What we need to do instead is take care of our veterans to direct our resources towards them. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you. Uh, our next question to you first, Mr. Hill. What is your opinion of the DEP decision to allow less stringent restrictions on carcinogens, such as benzene, which is used in fracking? I'm a big proponent of fracking. We have seen what it has done in our nation. It has lowered the cost of fuel, the cost of gasoline. We see it at the pumps. It has created an economic boom, not only in, a, um, in our local area in Florida, but across the United States. We have now become an exporter of energy, and that is what fracking has done. Fracking still needs to be uh, looked at closely to make sure that it's done safely, that it's not affecting our environment, but I am a big proponent of that and that we should continue it. All right, thank you. This question to you now, Mr. Broxson. What is your opinion of the DEP decision to allow less stringent restrictions on carcinogens, such as benzene, which is used in fracking? Well, I don't think the, uh, that they've made those decisions that puts the safety of the public at risk. I'm proud to say I'm from a county that produces 90% of all the energy that's ever been produced in the state of Florida. And if you go and visit Jay, and I encourage you to do that, you'll go and you'll see a vibrant small community with healthy children, healthy plants, healthy animals that have been doing that for over 60 years. The idea that we would allow there to be safety issues with producing of oil, we have perfected on land drilling. Now we're not very good a mile in the deep, which we proved that with BP, but we know how to drill on land and do it safely. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Broxson, and our final question, we begin with you. What steps will you take to bring more industries and jobs into our region? Well, that is a phenomenal question. And today the governor flew in, and I was proud to stand with him as we celebrated the fact that Florida, in five years since I've been in office and since he's been in office, has produced over 1.1 million new jobs. That came at a cost. Florida had to participate. We're in a border state that deals with the state of Alabama. Alabama spent $300 million to get Airbus, and we're in competition with them. The reason we have Navy Federal is because we were willing to step up and make sure they did not transfer back to Virginia the 10,000 jobs that they're gonna have here. And we will continue to do that because it's too important to people that they have good paying jobs. All right, thank you, Mr. Brox and Mr. Hill. Same question now to you. What steps will you take to bring more industries and jobs to our region? Well, what I would do instead of using capital cronyism and picking winners and losers to come into the state, I would create an environment that would attract all businesses to come here, which would, the simple formula for that is to reduce taxes, to reduce unnecessary regulations. That creates the environment for businesses to want to move here not taking taxpayers' money and giving it to corporations to come here because <clears throat> that is taxpayers' hard-earned money. Representative Broxson voted for that. I voted against it. Instead, I support those things which we know work. 
lowering taxes, and getting rid of unnecessary regulations. All right, Mr. Hill, thank you so much. And that concludes the questions for Florida Senate District 1. Time now for closing statements. We began the question and answer session with Mr. Broxson, and so we'll now begin the closing statements with Mr. Hill, and you'll have 45 seconds for your closing statement. I understand that it is my responsibility to provide good public policy to the citizens who I represent. Good public policy for me consists of, um, is it constitutional? Is it fiscally responsible? Will it fix a problem instead of create a problem? And is it morally sound? Constitutional is so important for me because I have a legacy of serving the military and my family. My grandfather served in World War I, my father in Vietnam. I served active duty Air Force and I have a son now, United States Marine Corps, who is actively deployed. That's, and we all sit an oath to that Constitution. That's why it is so important to me to be fiscally responsible. We should. We should use the money to spread out as much across the state evenly instead of giving it away to corporations. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. And Mr. Broxson, now your closing statement, 45 seconds. In 2010, if my opponent would have been senator, Navy Federal would have gone back to their property in Virginia. We would have lost the potential of 10,000 jobs. Now think about this. Florida spends almost $20 billion for taking care of the poor, the charity, health care. Many of those people would like to be working, to have a good job, but if there are no jobs available or if there's no training available for good jobs, then what we've done is we've handicapped our system and we've forced people into a system where they have to be dependent on the government. That's bad government and I am a, I'm against that. We have to be more proactive and make, sh make sure that people that want to work can work. All right, thank you, Mr. Broxson, and thank you both gentlemen for joining us tonight. As we wrap up the first race of the evening, we want to remind you that you are watching Rally 2016 here on WSRE TV, where candidates in the upcoming primary election have the opportunity to answer questions about some of the issues. The questions for tonight's races were prepared by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area and Okaloosa County. Up next, we move to Florida House of Representatives District 4. We'll return in just a moment, but now here's a look at some of our upcoming races. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Metis, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV, and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I am Haley Richards. Ellen Rossin and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For nearly 30 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. For more information, visit lwvpba.org or lwvogaloosa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year.
Welcome back to Rally 2016 on WSRE TV, where you are hearing from the candidates in the upcoming primary election. And we are moving on now to the race for Florida House of Representatives District 4. There are five Republican candidates on the ballot. However, one of them, Wayne R. Harris, is not able to attend rally tonight. The four other Republican candidates in the primary are here and in alphabetical order. They are Miss Lori Bartlett, Mr. Armin Izzo, Mr. Mel Ponder, and Mr. Jonathan Michael Tallman. Candidates, welcome. Thank you. It's now time for your first question, and we will begin the questioning with Ms. Bartlett. First question to you. Please describe your positions on the legislative responsibility for protecting the public interest in education, health care, and criminal justice systems. Do you have any specific proposals to improve these systems? Um, that's a big question for 45 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am a very strong proponent of protecting our education and furthering it. Uh, I'm also very a strong proponent of getting Common Core out of our system and putting education back into our local government. I'm a very strong proponent of getting our parents involved in their children again. I think over the years we have moved away from that. Uh, your second question was health care. Health care. Um, with any system that we have today, I think we need to take a step back and I think we need to look at the processes that we are using currently as we look at healthcare and look at our fraud and see where we're at where we could start, not necessarily start over. Anyway, okay. thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right, next uh, to you, Mr. Izzo. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, describe your positions on the legislative responsibility for protecting the public interest in education, healthcare, and criminal justice systems. Do you have any specific proposals to improve these systems? I appreciate that. I'm a huge proponent of education and specifically in education, the choice that the parents get to make. So I would, as a legislator, fight, fight for that greater ability for the parents to choose. In terms of health care, it's important to take care of the people, but we have to also be considered with the escalating growth of entitlement programs. So I would keep as a legislator that in check and balance, not too high of uh, the, the growth in those. And then finally, the, uh, the question on the ju judicial system. There, the, uh, the concern is, and where I would focus is on is what they call the revolving door. And I would focus on that, letting the criminals out too soon. All right, thank you. Mr. Ponder, to you now, what specific proposals do you have, if any, to improve these systems? Sure, absolutely. You know, with education, the biggest thing that I would be against would be Common Core. You know, we don't need a federally pushed down education system of a one size fits all. I think a lot of the decisions should be made at the local level uh, by parents and teachers involvement. I think that's critical and important. Also working with uh, teachers in the current school system to train children up so that they're equipped for jobs on day one. Um, just to work with them from that regard. From a health care perspective, you know, we need to do what we can to, to really stop Obamacare and the added costs that come from that. You know, the costs right now are expected, we're supposed to have uh, as many or more people uninsured by 2025 than we did when it first started. So you got to look at like things like Section 1332, take advantage of waivers. We'll start that in January and other things like that. All right, thank you, Mr. Ponder. And now finally to you, Mr. Tallman. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, I have it, thank you. Right, um, you know, as far as, as far as education goes, I think that we need to make sure that we, I'm a proponent of school choice. We need to make sure that we keep that and protect that for, for Florida's children. Um, also, as far as healthcare goes, we need to make healthcare more affordable. Because of the failed policies of Barack Obama, healthcare costs are going up, premiums are going up, deductibles are going up, and it's costing everybody more. Um, and so that's definitely something that um, one of the committees I would like to serve on is the health care committee to try to stop this um, increase. Um, as far as the judicial system goes, we need to look at it from a business perspective and we need to look at some reforms, but make sure that it's, it, it is effective and costing um, the taxpayers less money. And um, thank you. All right, you can finish up, but all right, thank you very much. All right, in our second question, we begin with you, Mr. Izzo. What is your view on the state versus local community responsibility for funding public education? 
I believe that at the very lowest level, that's where the funding should take place. If it could happen at the kitchen table, that's correct. It could happen at the uh, county level or the city level, that would be the right place. When we begin to expand and increase the coverage from state, even to nation, we begin to then put in standards that maybe don't fit. So I'm a proponent to have education funded at the lowest level. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Izzo. And before we continue, just a reminder, when you hear uh, a ding, it's a five second warning that your 45 seconds is coming close and will certainly allow you time to finish a, th a thought. There will be no hooks that will take you off the podium. <laughs> so our next question goes to you, Mr. Ponder. What is your view on the state versus local community responsibility for funding public education? Sure, great question. You know, I believe it's more of a, uh, really a partnership you know, between the state and the local level at the moment. Uh, the biggest thing I'd be concerned about is where it turns into a situation of unfunded mandates that come back and really um, can actually have a, a sting at the local level. Um, you know, I, I think the cost, um, it, because their taxes are really generated at the local level, it's why I believe it's, I'm a big believer in making sure some of the decision making uh, with parents and superintendents and teachers and faculty are handled at the local level since some of the funding comes from there. And so therefore, right now, I believe it's a partnership um, and I believe it's working. And so that's what I believe. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Ponder. Mr. Tallman, do you need me to repeat the question? Um, no, it's okay. okay. Um, I, I'm for local control of schools. I think that the, the state has too much bureaucracy within the um, state education system. Um, and I think that if we were to eliminate some of the, um, some of the state positions, um, we could really free up a lot more money that can go back into the classroom for the students. And, and I think that sometimes the standards that um, are placed upon from the state to the, to the local school board, school districts, um, really hurt innovation in the classroom and, and don't allow teachers to teach at their fullest level. And sometimes there are things that you can't test on an FCAT or an FSA or an end of course exam, but um, can be very helpful for the student in the long term. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Tallman. And Ms. Bartlett, we take now, turn now to you for this next question. Now, what do you think? What's your view on state versus local responsibility? Thank you very much. I think uh, we have funded this year 7,000 per children and added another 3,000 uh, per child, which I think is great from the state. Um, I, as I said before, I'm a great proponent for parents getting involved, but I also think we need to look at our local school systems and see if we are overridden with the administration inside of it, because a lot of the money, I believe, is going to administration when it should be going into the children. We could create uh, programs inside of the community for children. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, uh, question three will go first to Mr. Ponder. The question is, the Florida Constitutional Revision Commission will convene in 2017. How will you ensure that the panhandle is adequately represented on the commission? Excellent. Uh, great question. Um, you know, I'm, uh, adhering to the Constitution is paramount, um, whether it's the state or federal. Um, and I believe, as I've been saying throughout my campaign, that Northwest Florida is significant. Uh, we're often overlooked by other parts of the state, um, but I believe there's significance here in Northwest Florida. And I think one of the things we don't have that we need to create is a stronger relationship or a coalition of sorts with other state representatives and senators up and down the coast so that when we come to things such as this, uh, we're not just one, one person represented, but we're a voice that's represented. So I believe as we come together as a united front, uh, we'll have a much stronger seat at the table when it comes to talking about things like our Florida Constitution. All right, thank you. And to you, Mr. Tallman, this question, how will you ensure that the panhandle is adequately represented on the Florida Constitution Revision Commission when it convenes next year? Sure, my, my biggest thing is I think that we need to work together as a team here in the panhandle. The problem is, is that the Florida legislature is population-based um, uh, representation. So um, if you take everyone in the central time zone, we represent less than 5% of the population in the state of Florida. So what we need to do is reach out to our partners um, in South Florida and Central Florida. Um, I've visited over 60 counties so far since getting into this campaign and learned, uh, I think the, the way to do it is to learn about different areas and to build those relationships with those other representatives and senators. And I have visited the Everglades, uh, the Indian River Lagoon, um, Tampa Bay, the port at, um, at Mayport at Jacksonville, and of course, you know, uh, in the Panhandle here too. And so I think that's the best way to do it is to build those relationships. All right, thank you, Mr. Tallman. Ms. Bartlett, this question now to you. How will you ensure that the panhandle is adequately represented on this particular commission? Well, I think we do. We all agree that we need to pull together through the state of Florida. Um, as the vice chair of the Republican Executive Committee, I've been very involved in, with our legislators for the last couple years. Um, but it's not only making sure that we're represented 
we need to continue to educate our own county. Um, and as we educate our county, then our county becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and our voices collectively are heard stronger at, at the Capitol. All right, thank you. And finally, to you, Mr. Izzo. Thank you, appreciate it. <clears throat> we have to work as a team and I would start building this team at the lowest level. The fourth district is uh, fairly small geographically, but it's very diverse from the Destin area with the uh, tourism there to where I live in Niceville and it's, uh, it's linked to the military. What we would do is bring different members from those, the stronger members there, and then begin to expand that team to encompass more of the panhandle towards Pensacola, towards Panama City Beach, to have the right representation because we're all independent little communities that have something special to offer and each should be afforded a voice to speak. All right, Mr. Tallman, we begin our next question with you. In light of the very expensive four years of litigation following the last redistricting effort, would you support formation of a bipartisan redistricting commission? And if so, why? If not, why not? Um, I, as at the current time, I wouldn't support that. Um, you know, I don't think that we need to worry about redistricting for another 10 years at the Senate level. And I don't think we need to worry about redistricting until 2018. Um, but it, whenever we do, um, I think that looking at it from a bipartisan perspective is very important. It needs to be a very transparent process and um, everybody needs to come to the table. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Tallman. Ms. Bartlett, we turn now to you. In light of the expense, would you support the formation of a bipartisan redistricting commission? Why or why not? And not at this point. I think uh, our state is facing a lot of um, issues that we need to look at. Um, we've talked about them, education, um, health care. We need to stop what we're doing, take a little break, look at where we are, and then we could spread out. I think we take on too much, too often, too many times, and everybody gets lost in the shuffle. And here we are today asking questions, how we're going to solve these problems. So we need to solve the problems first, and then we can move out to redistricting if we need to. All right, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Mr. Izzo? Appreciate that. Deb. There are so many problems and the prioritizing them is the right approach to tackling it. For me, the redistricting is not a priority. No, not, more importantly would be looking at infrastructure, the lifeblood, the communication lines, the ports, the airports, the roads. That's more important to me than, than spending money or looking into the cost that's involved in putting together a partisan or bipartisan committee to think about redistricting. More importantly, we should begin to think about higher priority problems. I think infrastructure is one. When I get to Tallahassee, that's one I'm going to focus on. All right, thank you. Mr. Ponder? Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe uh, looking at a redistricting right now is a priority, nor should it be. Uh, there's a high expense, as you talked about in the question, uh, to try to do that, and I don't think now is the time. Uh, if in, and, uh, an event does take place in the future, I believe full transparency needs to be on board. I believe uh, the ground rules should be fully understood on the, on the foresight, uh, because at this point things became convoluted on the back end, which caused a lot of litigation and the trouble. Uh, but I agree with what the other said. There's so many more priorities in our state right now, creating jobs, coming against illegal, illegal immigrants, terrorism, infrastructure, uh, water quality. Those things are where we need to put our priority on, not doing another round of, of this. All right, thank you so much, candidates. And we are now midway through our questions for the candidates running for Florida House District 4. We will continue right after the short break. Stay with us. Thank you for watching Rally 2016 on WSRE TV. I'm Mary Blackwell, President of the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. For nearly 30 years, the Okaloosa and Pensacola Bay Area Leagues have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. The success of our democracy depends on active participation by informed citizens, which begins with voting. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan, which means we do not support or oppose parties or candidates. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments, merit retention of judges, or other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of League. For more information, please see our website, 
and you can contact us there too. Please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on Election Day. To vote by mail, contact the Okaloosa County Supervisor of Elections office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or visit the Supervisor's office locations in Crestview and Fort Walton Beach. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections offices by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 20th through Saturday, August 27th at the five locations listed on screen. Hours for early voting are 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. each day. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring your photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to WSRE's Rally 2016. If you are just joining us, we are focusing on the candidates for the upcoming primary election, and we are now wrapping up a question and answer session with those running for Florida House District 4. And again, Mr. Harris is not able to attend rally tonight. Let's continue now. We began with Mr. Tallman for our last question, and so we'll be back to Ms. Bartlett. It is your turn. The Constitution, the Florida Constitution, provides that one-third of the revenue from real estate transactions will be used for land and water acquisitions. However, the legislature used a portion of these funds for salaries. How should this diversion be corrected? Interesting question. I don't know how, I don't know how it should be diverted. Um, it needs to stop immediately. That's not what the funds are used for. And um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the process that needs to happen, but it does, it does need to happen. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Izzo, this question to you in relation to the diversion of some of these funds from uh, the revenue from real estate transactions used in part for salaries, how should this diversion be corrected? It should be stopped. I'm opposed to uh, developing a tax and then having the tax pay for multiple things that are apart from what it was initially designed for. As a country, we're seeing a real problem in Social Security because we built up a fund and now we're using that money for something else. If this money is earmarked for environmental protection, for infrastructure, that's what it should go for. And it shouldn't go for other things. And I would fight that the tax that we collect goes for the specific person reason we're collecting that tax. All right, thank you. Mr. Ponder. Yeah, thank you. You know, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that they found it. Um, you know, I believe a, a strong system of checks and balances. When you ever have anything that's legislatively done and accounting wise from that standpoint, it's good that we have a system of checks and balances. So I'm first, I'm glad it was discovered. Secondly, they need to right the ship. Uh, and thirdly, when there's funds that are dedicated for a certain bucket, they don't need to be uh, robbed from in order to pay for something else. The, the real estate transactions in our state are a big funding source. And you know, it's not just this, but things like the Sadowski Fund and things like that for low-income housing. We need to make sure that the integrity of those funds go to the intended purpose they were designed for. And so thankfully, I am glad that through whatever audit process this was discovered it was, we need to no longer allow it to happen and put the funds back where they properly go. All right, thank you. And finally, this question to you, Mr. Tallman. Do you need me to repeat it? I, I have it. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, as far as the Amendment One dollars are concerned, you know, I really think they should be used for their intended purpose. And one of the things that I think we can use the, those dollars for is stormwater management. If you look at our area, that's one of the large infrastructure needs that we have in our area. It's a fifty million dollar need in Okaloosa County. And from a business perspective, if we look at how we can make sure that we're good stewards of environmental issues like making sure we keep Choctatchee Bay clean. If we do that, that's going to increase um, from an economic perspective because more tourists are going to come to our area. More tourists are going to use the beach and to um, use some of those things. So I think that we really need to look at using those dollars for their intended purpose for stormwater. Thank you. All right, time now for question number six. And Mr. Izzo, we will begin with you. Do you support Amendment 4? Why or why not? Do I support Amendment 4? That's, uh, I just read about that today, and I do. I do support it, and, uh, and uh, I, you catch me at the quick, and I uh, energy, and that's to allow the, uh, the 
more, the greater funding of solar power is what it is. And so I believe in that, that uh, we should focus it. Actually, what we're going to see is it's on the ballot. We're going to see what the Floridians think about that. And I think that that's an excellent way to do things, whether we want to think about expanding gambling or, or uh, other issues, is to make it a ballot initiative. So it has to do with expanding the energy, solar energy. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Izzo. Mr. Ponder. Yeah, just real simply, yeah, I do support it. Um, as Mr. Izzo said, it will come to a vote by the citizens of Florida. You know, I think we should look at uh, diversifying ways of energy that we can, and I know solar is one of them, um, and I'm so glad that the, the state legislator um, uh, saw it upon themselves to bring it before a vote before the citizenry, and so th therefore I'm glad. All right, thank you, Mr. Ponder. Mr. Tallman. I do su support Amendment 4. Um, I think that Amendment 4 um, it makes sense from a business perspective. It's endorsed by the Florida Chamber of Commerce and um, it makes sense because what it does is, is it allows for tax exemptions for solar energy not to be counted as real property values. Um, so if a company wants to come to Florida and, and install solar panels, um, like, like Tesla for instance has done in Nevada, um, that, that, could, that would not be included in the costs of their taxable tangible property taxes. And so I, I'm in support of it. Excellent, thank you so much. Ms. Bartlett? I'm not in support of it. Um, we, we have become a great country because of the free market and we need to honor our constitution. And if we keep putting amendments up to the constitution to break the constitution away from what it was designated for originally, then we lose. Solar energy should be a free market. Not everybody wants to buy it. Not everybody wants to put panels on their house. And we cannot decide which way an economy is going to go because we give them tax breaks. All right. Thank you, Ms. Barlett. All right. Our next question will go to Mr. Ponder first. In light of recent events in Orlando and elsewhere, what is your position on open slash campus carry? You know, it's a, a foundation that starts with uh, protecting our Second Amendment. And I'm a big believer that's a constitutional right. We need to preserve and protect that. Uh, and so that's at its core. You know, there's been an uh, onslaught of attack against that. Anytime there's a, a shooting of some kind, the first thing to do is the knee-jerk reaction. A lot of times by the media and whatnot is to come after and say it's the gun's fault. Uh, well, it's a, it's a character fault. It's an issue that was something going on with the person at the time. Uh, and so therefore, the foundation, we need to first protect our Second Amendment. As regard to open carry, I'm a supporter of that. And so therefore, that's the second tier of that. Right now in Florida, they tried to rally that and pass it last year. Uh, next year, should I have the honor to, to win, then that be back on the ballot. We'll look to push that through next year. Uh, but we need to preserve and protect concealed carry already. And then next step would be good pursuing open carry. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Tallman, this question to you now. What is your position on open slash campus carry? Well, I support both of them. I support constitutional carry, open carry, campus carry. I'm endorsed by the National Rifle Association because the National Rifle Association believes that out of every candidate here that I believe in the Second Amendment and am the strongest advocate for, for gun owners' rights. Um, as far as looking at some of the issues associated with it, well, instead of looking at, at firearms or, or the weaponry, what we need to look at is mental health issues. Um, mental health is, is significantly underfunded in Florida compared to our, our neighbor to the North Alabama. It's double the amount of funding in Alabama as we have in Florida. So I, I think that's a, a big issue. It affects one in five Floridians. Um, so mental health is, is the issue, not the firearms. All right, thank you, Mr. Tallman. And now that question to you, Ms. Bartlett, uh, on your position regarding open and or campus carry. I am for um, open carry. I am for campus carry. However, our world is changing, and I think it's important that we start educating our children from a very early age, gun safety, the importance of um, the importance of gun safety and how to use it. I think it's unfair to the population just to, to, to lay it out for everyone to have open carry. We need to have stringent um, illegals. We cannot have any, any illegals carrying open carry. We need to know that, but we have to train our children from an early age. It's a changing world and we have to recognize that. All right, thank you. And finally to you, Mr. Izzo. Thank you. I am for open carry and campus carry. I've devoted my entire adult life to defending the entire Constitution, all the articles, all the, the, all the, uh, the rights. 
I think that uh, what we should do, or where we end up going, as opposed to attacking the amendments and restricting our rights, is look at the criminal aspect of it and, and the, the rules, the laws, the amount of time that a criminal spends in jail when they commit crimes. Begin to focus our attention there as opposed to attacking one amendment or all the amendments or the Constitution for that matter. Thank you. All right, and that concludes the questions for the candidates for Florida House District 4. We turn now to closing remarks, and each candidate will have 45 seconds to make their statement. And continuing in our rotation, this time we begin with you, Mr. Stall Mr. Tallman. You have 45 seconds. Thank you. Um, I, I was born and raised in Okaloosa County, grew up in Okaloosa County, and just want to bring conservative values and principles to Tallahassee, and I want to run Florida more like a business. Please visit my website, votetalman.com, votetalman.com, votetalman.com. We'd appreciate your vote August 30th. If you have an absentee ballot, um, we would appreciate your vote absentee. And if you want to vote early, we'd appreciate your vote early too. Again, please visit my website, votetalman.com. Thank you so much. And now a closing statement from Ms. Bartlett. Thank you very much. Uh, as a longtime Okaloosa County resident and being very involved in the political system inside of Okaloosa County, I think it's important that we keep Okaloosa County extremely conservative and very strong. I believe the stronger that we grow as um, we'll become a beacon of light for other communities that want to grow in a conservative manner that they can come and look at us and follow that model and that pattern and we could keep Florida very, very strong in the conservative arena and free market. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Bartlett. Now to you, Mr. Izzo. Thank you. I'm a 22-year Air Force veteran. I have deep ties in the community. But my over 34 years of experience in the defense industry sets me apart from the others that are running in this race, and it's vital because the economic engine of the 4th District is the military. I've been knocking on doors for months, and too often I hear, when you get elected, please don't do like the others and forget about us. Well, not me. I won't. I'm going to continue to knock on doors and continue to listen to you about your concerns for our community. Please contact me at izzoforrep.com. Thank you for having me this evening, and remember, elect a vet. Thank you, Mr. Izzo, and now, Mr. Ponder, your closing statement, thank 45 you. seconds. Great, thank you. Uh, I was born and raised in Ocala, Florida. I'm a third generation Floridian. My wife was raised in Northwest Florida. We raised our three children here. Um, I've been a registered conservative Republican uh, since I was 18, for a long time now. I believe in conservative values. I believe Tallahassee needs more of what we can bring to the table. I'm a firm believer that when you focus on what unites us as opposed to divides us, we can achieve so much more together. My slogan is, let's work together, and that uh, runs throughout my whole campaign uh, of bringing people together to, to work on that unity and to have a much stronger voice in Tallahassee to fight for things that are really ours. Uh, Melforhouse.com is my website. I encourage you to please check it out. Uh, also, if you're voting early, uh, please, I'd be honored if you keep me in mind. Uh, August 30th is the, uh, our final date. And again, melforhouse.com. Please check out my website. I'd be honored to earn your vote. Thank you, Mr. Ponder, and thank you, candidates. And, of course, we have much more to come this evening, including races in Okaloosa County. And here's a look at what's ahead here on Rally 2016 on WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Stay with us. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I am Haley Richards. Ellen Rostin and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For nearly 30 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. For more information, visit lwvpba.org or lwvokaloosa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year.
Welcome back to Rally 2016 as we count down to the Florida primary election, which is coming up in about four weeks on August 30th. We turn our focus now this evening on contests in Okaloosa County. Up next, the race for County Commission District 1. There are three Republican candidates in this race. One of them is not with us tonight. James Walker is not attending rally this evening. Introducing the other candidates alphabetically, the first in the race for County Commission District 1 is Mr. Thomas Gerald Cannon Jr. And seated next to him is Graham Fountain. Welcome to you candidates. All right, it is now time to begin with the questions and question number one will be posed to you first, Mr. Cannon. Do you support expansion of public transit service in the county? If so, how would you propose to fund and implement expansion? If not, what is your proposed alternative? I don't know that we need it expanded. It could be run a little more efficiently. We may need to use some different vehicles. Right now we're running some larger vehicles uh, that aren't full. And we may need to rethink how we call the vehicles rather than trying to run a route. But it, I think we do need to continue with it. There's a lot of people that uh, use it to get to work and get to the doctor. They do pay a user fee. I don't know that we can increase that much, but you know, that's a possibility also. All right, thank you. Now to you, Mr. Fountain. Do you support expansion of public transit service in the county? If so, how would you propose to fund and implement expansion? If not, what's your alternative? Well, in Okaloosa County, we, we have public uh, transportation now. Uh, at one time, we ran it very much in-house. Uh, today, we have a contract uh, with a subcontractor that does the job, and it's going to be an experiment over the next year or two to see how that works. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing if we may can look at other alternatives with new commercial ventures such as Uber and Lyft and other paid services to see if they may actually can provide that service cheaper than running these buses up and down the road as, as Mr. Cannon spoke to that sometimes have one or two people on them and are not filled up. So I'm interested in looking at some other alternative means that maybe can actually uh, save a little bit of money and also uh, nurture some other businesses that are coming online here in Northwest Florida. All right, thank you, Mr. Fountain. And this question, the next question will go to you first. How would you propose uh, funding the repair and or replacement of deteriorating stormwater infrastructure in the county? Well, our, our stormwater infrastructure, of course, is tied very much to our, our roadways and our transportation systems. Uh, we are suffering uh, right now because of a lack of uh, fuel tax revenues. Uh, Florida's fuel tax revenue is going down much uh, dependent on or, or because of smaller vehicles and less fuel being purchased. Uh, we certainly are applying for special grants through uh, DOT and looking at other avenues to try to get funding for uh, the stormwater, but we definitely gonna have to look at some different uh, methods to do that. Some areas are looking at actually doing uh, referendums for sales tax to deal with some of the uh, 40 or $50 million I think we probably could use tomorrow to, to fulfill our needs in, in that. All right, thank you, Mr. Fountain. And now that question to you, Mr. Cannon. How would you propose funding the repair and or replacement of deteriorating stormwater infrastructure in Okaloosa County? Well, hopefully we can convince the state that we do need some grants, as Mr. Fountain said, because our revenues are dropping on the fuel as they are nationwide because of the EPA regulations. Ultimately, we're gonna to have to fund it by some method and the fuel tax is our only, other than grants, the fuel tax is our avenue. So one day that may have to change. All right, thank you. Our next question to you first, Mr. Cannon. In light of the threat of the Zika virus and other mosquito-borne diseases, what is your plan to bring the latest research and development advances to county mosquito control and or elimination in the county? Well, I believe that the state should take the lead in the mosquito control and it should filter down through us. We have our own spray people and we, you know, have to use approved sprays, but it's probably more of an educate the population. We, we need to do that standing water, like the governor said, 
is the big problem that needs to be eliminated. Aside from that, um, the state needs to take the lead and let us know what the best methods are and what we can use if there is something better than what we're using now. All right, thank you. And this question now to you, Mr. Fountain. What is your plan to bring the latest research and development advances to county mosquito control? Well, the, the state of Florida Department of Health, uh, working with our county health departments, are already very much involved in this at this point in time, although our incidences of Zika is, is fairly small in Florida compared to what may be in South America, for instance. But they are doing it. Uh, there's probably very little uh, scientific research been done just yet as far as genetics and long-term uh, uh, testing on that. But we do have a plan. We, we publicized our plan as far as uh, taking care of uh, areas where the mosquitoes breed. We've uh, identified high-risk zones in Okaloosa County, and they've already published those areas where people live that they need to pay uh, extremely more attention in those areas uh, to that. So, so we're already on board and working to do just about as much as we can do in, in Florida right now. All right, thank you. Uh, we're up to question number four, and it will go first to you, Mr. Fountain. Would you support lobbying for restoration of Gulf Coast passenger rail between New Orleans and Jacksonville with a stop at Crestview? Why or why not? Well, we definitely support uh, uh, Amtrak uh, continuing to come through Okaloosa County. I actually uh, went to the, the uh, uh, show we had where they came and brought the train through and uh, visited with their professionals. So we definitely would like to see them and we certainly would support that uh, and certainly making Crestview one of the stops and we'll even build them, a, a, I think the city's already planning on building a new building when they come through there. So absolutely, that'd be a great, great thing for our county. All right, thank you. To you, Mr. Cannon, would you support lobbying for restoration of Gulf Coast passenger rail between New Orleans and Jacksonville and with a stop in Crestview? Yes, I would. Hopefully they can have a stop that's not in the middle of the night. We were low use, that's why they dropped us, because you'd have to catch the train, what, between two and, well, early in the morning. But it would be a wonderful thing, although the downside is, more people using trains, we have even less uh, gasoline revenue, so. But even still, the train would be a wonderful thing to have for the county, yes, I'd support it. All right, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Cannon, and this next question will go to you first. How do you propose to fund the repair and or replacement of aging school infrastructure and expansion to accommodate overcrowding due to new home development? We're, we're probably going to have to look at sales tax to fund the schools. Um, a lot of the schools in Okaloosa County are my age and that's not the best. <laughs> and I've been in a lot of them and they need work, so we're probably going to have to do a referendum and see about a sales tax because we're, we're getting to the critical point. We have roofs leaking and uh, a lot of other issues at our local schools. All right, thank you. And Mr. Fountain, that question to you on uh, how to repair and or replace aging school infrastructure and uh, to accommodate and expansion to accommodate overcrowding due to new home development. Uh, in Oakloose County, the, uh, the overcrowding is really not due to home development per se. Uh, we have a great school system and we have a lot of facilities. We have several schools that are, have reached their capacity and they need to be uh, added on to. And then the actual age, as is, is, uh, Mr. Cannon spoke of, is causing a lot of problems with maintenance. Our school system is constantly and right about now debating uh, some methodology of putting on some referendums possibly. Uh, for, for a sales tax, but as we know in some of the counties they pass, sometimes they don't pass. The last time we had one it did not pass, so we'll have to see if they can make a case to the public that it's worth increasing the sales tax to fix all this uh, infrastructure. All right, thank you Mr. Fountain and thank you candidates. And now each of our candidates will have 45 seconds to make a closing statement and continuing as we were, we begin with you Mr. Fountain, 45 seconds. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're, we've enjoyed being here. Uh, I am Graham Fountain and I'm a candidate for District 1. I am uniquely qualified to take over as the District 1 County Commissioner with over three decades of law enforcement, executive, public safety experience, and also small business experience. I have led uh, thousands of men and women and I've managed over a half a billion dollars in work programs and budgets in the state of Florida. Everything from being undersheriff in Oak Okaloosa County to being a statewide law enforcement director in Tallahassee, 
I've worked in the legislature. I've worked in front of our county commissions. I know the legislative business, and most of all, I know how to lead and, and, and develop uh, oversight uh, of our county commission. So I would ask you to uh, give me a chance on November 30th and vote Graham Fountain. Thank you, Mr. Fountain. Mr. Cannon, your closing statement. Okay, I am Tom Cannon, and I want to be the Okaloosa County Commission, and I believe my over 30 years of business experience and ownership and management of businesses would qualify me to manage the county. I've taken accounting classes, and uh, I know how to look. I believe what we need is some transparency and oversight in Okaloosa County, and I know how to accomplish that. So I, I'd ask you to please vote for me on August the 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. And those were the candidates for County Commission District 1. In just a moment, we'll move on to the race for sheriff. Rally 2016 will return in a moment. There is one amendment to the Florida Constitution on the August primary ballot. A 60% margin is required for passage. Here's a brief look at what that amendment covers. Amendment 4, solar devices or renewable energy source devices, exemption from certain taxation and assessment. The ballot summary reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution to authorize the legislature by general law to exempt from ad valorem taxation the assessed value of solar or renewable energy source devices subject to tangible personal property tax and authorize the legislature by general law to prohibit consideration of such devices in assessing the value of real property for ad valorem taxation purposes. This amendment takes effect January 1, 2018 and expires on December 31st, 2037. For more detailed, nonpartisan information, you can access the Florida League Voters Guide. Log on to thefloridavoter.org, the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida. Follow the steps shown on screen in order to obtain the Guide to Florida Amendments. This guide will display a synopsis of the amendment and an explanation of what a yes or no vote will mean. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Santa Rosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Santa Rosa County Supervisor of Elections Office by phone, mail, fax, or email. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on election day. Early voting takes place from Monday, August 15th through Saturday, August 27th in Milton, Pace, and at two locations in the Greater Gulf Breeze area. Early voting hours each day are 8.30 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2016. I'm Molly Barrows with WSRE. Thank you for joining us tonight as we question the candidates in the primary election coming up on August 30th. Now up next is the race for Okaloosa County Sheriff. There are two Republican candidates on the ballot. This is a universal race and it's open to all registered voters in the county. The winner of this primary will win the race on election day. And it is time now to meet those candidates for the seat. Seated alphabetically, we first meet the incumbent, Mr. Larry Ashley. And his challenger is Mr. Brian Kokenauer. Welcome to both of you. And gentlemen, I'll ask each of you a number of questions and you'll have 45 seconds to respond. And again, in alphabetical order, we begin question number one with Mr. Ashley. So Mr. Ashley, would you support bringing gun safety workshops and educational presentations to this area and providing trained deputies to conduct them? If so, why? If not, why not? Great question. Yes, we already do that. We provide a citizen's firearm safety class. It's one of our most popular uh, courses with, amongst our citizens. We have literally trained hundreds just in the past year. And it's citizens that uh, want to know how to use a firearm in order to protect themselves, whether it's target acquisition or weapon retention, what are the laws regarding self-defense, 
and uh, so that they can maintain that. And we'll continue to do that. We do that with our Explorers program, uh, with our youth, uh, that those that want to go into the law enforcement profession, and we also support the NRA's uh, uh, gun safety program for our youth and adults. All right, thank you, Mr. Ashley. Mr. Koganauer, would you support bringing gun safety workshops and educational presentations and having deputies conduct them? Oh, absolutely. As the sheriff says, he, he conducts that now. And as your sheriff, I would continue to do that. There is, that is a win-win situation for law enforcement and the community. Anytime we can promote gun safety, it's a good idea. All right, thank you. And we begin our next question with you, Mr. Kokenauer. Do you support providing additional training and or a buddy system for process servers? Why or why not? And what alternatives do you propose to ensure their safety, the safety of process servers? I, uh, to answer that, I, I don't know that, to, that that's fiscally possible at, the, at this time. Uh, I would be supportive of looking into that and, and making a decision based on that. I, that would be an extremely cost-heavy uh, situation to have a buddy system work like that. Uh, beyond that, that would be something I would have to look into. All right, thank you so much. Mr. Ashley? What we do, um, we have our change in uh, policy here recently is uh, a red sheet and a red sheet uh, that the judge views and that the officer also views is any threats made in a domestic violence threat or injunction that's being served uh, then we'll send two officers uh, if there's been a previous th threat if there's not been a previous threat then we'll send one officer and uh, that's been working for us all right, and we begin question number three with you, Mr. Ashley. Do you support the stand your ground law as it's currently written? And if not, what amendments to it would you propose? No, I certainly support it. I sat on the stand your ground task force, uh, the citizen safety and protection uh, task force. Uh, Governor Scott appointed me to that. I went around the state of Florida talking to citizens, every citizen in the state of Florida, every group, whether they leaned left or leaned right, uh, wants the ability to defend themselves. Uh, the only change that the change was basically take the, the castle doctrine that says my home is my castle and I can protect it and that uh, the intent is built into the law that if you break into my home, whether you're there to rape, rob, and murder me or steal my microwave, I have the right to defend my home uh, with the use of force, including deadly force. And I certainly support that, uh, and that ability to do that while I having to retreat. All right, thank you, Mr. Ashley. Mr. Kokenauer, same question to you. Do you support the stand your ground law as it's written now, and would you make any amendments if you don't? I absolutely support it. I, I don't believe that any amendment needs to be made to that law. It is, uh, it is well written. And, and clear from what I have read is a clear law. You have the right to defend yourself in your home. I see no reason to change anything in that. All right, thank you so much. And we will begin our next question with you as well. Do you support open campus carry? Why or why not? I do not support open carry on campus. I do support concealed carry on, uh, on any state campus. I believe that if the, uh, if the carrier receives the permit and is legally uh, acceptable to receive that permit, they should be allowed to carry a gun in, in order to defend themselves if necessary, just as if they were off campus. All right, thank you. Mr. Ashley? I support open carry, uh, concealed carry, I'm sorry, on campus uh, because if we were to separate adults from youth, uh, then, then I might be more inclined to, but right now our, our the requirements in order to get a concealed weapons permit, they're, they're pretty relaxed. I can dry fire into a, a, a barrel and now I'm certified to, to carry concealed without the training necessary uh, regarding weapon retention or uh, the type of ammo you use, uh, target acquisition. So defending myself does not relieve me from the obligation of, of, of not being grossly negligent in defending myself. So I can't shoot an attacker and, and hit somebody at a and a bus down the street and say that uh, somehow that I, that was my right. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Ashley. And we begin our next question with you. Okaloosa County, of course, home to the largest U.S. Air Force base in the world and the Air Force Special Operations Command. How would you modify the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office emergency response procedures in light of an increased threat or of a, of a terrorist attack? Well, we've also in, uh, added the Joint Strike Force F-35 group, the 7th Special Forces group since 2010. Our residential population has grown by nearly 10%. Our, our tourist population has grown by nearly 85%. <clears throat> our military is, is, is the backbone of our economy. And I think it's why we have one of the lowest crime rates in the state of Florida is because we do have so many uh, military members there. And uh, our counter surveillance and, and uh, uh, anti-terrorist uh, units 
and uh, intelligence gathering is, is second to none. So I, I think we're well prepared for uh, the inevitable. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Ashley. Mr. Kokenauer, again, the question, it's home, of course, to a large military presence, including the Air Force Special Operations Command. Would you modify the Sheriff's Office emergency response procedures in light, and how would you do that in light of, a, of an increased terrorist attack? And uh, modifying them perhaps only in, in more training, uh, specifically some training with the military. I know that in years past, the SRT team for the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office has done some training with the military uh, units. However, that's very limited. If we could, if we could open that up and do a little more training with them and get a little, a little more uh, clear idea of how they operate and, and what they do and how they will operate in such an emergency, then we can be better prepared. And we will begin our next question with you as well. If elected, do you have any changes in mind for current Okaloosa Sheriff's Office hiring procedures? And if so, what are they? I do. I, I believe that uh, we can begin by changing our recruiting standards and, and what, we're, what we're doing to recruit from outside the area. Uh, it's very hard for, for the sheriff to find enough capable people here in Okaloosa County that want to be a deputy sheriff. So we need to move outside our, our comfort zone, outside the county, perhaps by advertising and, and even by training, paying to train those people under a contract program where they would come in and, and contract to work with us, guarantee they would work with us for two years in exchange for us paying for their basic rec recruit training and then taking them on through field training. All right, thank you, Mr. Kokenauer. Mr. Ashley, if reelected, do you have any changes in mind for current Sheriff's Office hiring procedures? And if so, what would they be? Well, it's a funny thing, we already offer the, the two-year program that, you know, if you stay with us for, for two years, then uh, we pay for your training. We already uh, have an Explorers program that if you go through the Explorer program, we'll pay you to go through the Academy. Uh, we try to uh, attract uh, minorities and others from around the, the state and the region uh, to come work. The, the problem we have is, is trying to find those individuals that meet our standard of that, that high standard and especially uh, that integrity standard and uh, it, that the wage of $36,000 a year. So we demand professional product, we demand for prof professional training, and we pay at a vocational price. And so uh, that becomes a, a, a difficult task, but there are, we have plenty of people that want to come work in law enforcement and we'll continue to seek those good ones. All right, thank you, Mr. Ashley. And we begin our last question with you. Does the Sheriff's Office have an adequate budget to support qualified staff and operations? If anybody knows me, they, they will know that the answer to that is no. Uh, we have not had an adequate budget. Uh, we have a more progressive uh, county commission that has certainly seen the importance, especially uh, in light of crime rates and uh, our population increases, our calls for service increases. We currently operate at the exact same budget this year, today, in 2016, as we did in 2007, 10 years. And uh, so there, we've had a, uh, again, a 10% increase in our residential population, nearly an 80% increase in our tourist population, and we operate with the same amount of manpower and the same budget we did 10 years ago. So, and that is after working ourselves back from having been cut by nearly 20% during a time when our crime rates were out of control. All right, thank you, Mr. Ashley. Mr. Kokenauer, do you think the Sheriff's Office has an adequate budget to support qualified staff and operations? I believe they do at this point. Uh, in 2010 through 2013, uh, Sheriff Ashley cut $3.9 million out of his budget. However, since 2014 through 2016, his budget has increased $4.6 million. So we're actually about $700,000 or more ahead of where we were when we started the cuts. Now there is, of course, there's cost of living expenses and, and such that are going to go up, but I believe we are more, in ad, more than adequate at this point to have the units replaced that we have lost during those cuts. None of those units have been replaced at this point. We have no traffic, uh, no POP squad, no DUI squad. Those units need to be reinstalled. All right, thank you, Mr. Kokenauer. And thank you, gentlemen. It's time now for closing statements and we begin the last question and answer session with Mr. Ashley. So Mr. Kokenauer will begin the first closing statement and you will each have 45 seconds. Mr. Kokenauer. Thank you. The sheriff's election is about your safety. It's about your family's safety. Uh, for my 25 years in law enforcement, I spent about 90% of that in, on the streets, uh, working patrol as a patrol deputy, a patrol supervisor, and finally as a watch commander. My opponent has spent the majority of his career behind a desk, uh, working very hard to become a good politician and he has done so admirably. Uh, 
the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office needs a leader that will lead them into the into the next term. Extending a, a series of training and programs that will bring about a stronger community and a safer community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kokenauer. Mr. Ashley, 45 seconds. I think I'm uniquely qualified. I thank you all uh, <clears throat> for having us here tonight. But uh, when it comes to being a sheriff, there's a, there's a lot more to it than making an arrest. Uh, you have a 30 plus million dollar budget and allocation of resources. I'm a, uh, I have a BS degree in criminal justice. I have a master's degree in public administration. I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy. And uh, we have done well. We're, we're nationally accredited. Less than 5% of law enforcement agencies in, in the United States achieve that. We achieved that this past year. We've achieved state accreditation. Less than half the law enforcement agencies in the state of Florida are, are state accredited. We've achieved that. We're a national model agency of the year this past year. Our school resource officer program is the best in the state of Florida. We have achieved and achieved and reachieved, and uh, Azure Sheriff will continue to do that. All right, thank you, Mr. Ashley, and thank you both gentlemen for joining us tonight. Those are the candidates for Okaloosa County Sheriff. We're taking a short break for some important voting information, and Sandra will have the questions for Okaloosa County property appraiser right after this. Stay with us. Thank you for watching Rally 2016 on WSRE TV. I'm Mary Blackwell, President of the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa County. For nearly 30 years, the Okaloosa and Pensacola Bay Area Leagues have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. The success of our democracy depends on active participation by informed citizens, which begins with voting. The League of Women Voters is nonpartisan, which means we do not support or oppose parties or candidates. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments, merit retention of judges, or other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of League. For more information, please see our website and you can contact us there too. Please remember to be an informed voter this year. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, contact the Okaloosa County Supervisor of Elections office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or visit the supervisor's office locations in Crestview and Fort Walton Beach. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections offices by 7 p.m. on election day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 20th through Saturday, August 27th at the five locations listed on screen. Hours for early voting are 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. each day. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring your photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2016. I'm Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. Tonight we are asking questions of the candidates running for office in the upcoming primary election. Our questions were prepared by the League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area, and Okaloosa County. We will now turn to the race for Okaloosa County property appraiser. There are three Republican candidates on the ballot. This is a universal race and is open to all registered voters in the county. The winner of the primary will take the seat on election day. Time now to meet the candidates in alphabetical order. We start with Mr. Mac Busby. Next to him is Miss Janet Fugate. And our third candidate is Mr. John Holgeen. Thank you candidates for joining us. We are ready to begin with five questions and you'll each have 45 seconds to respond. Mr. Busby will start and then we'll rotate between the candidates as we go along in alphabetical order. All right, Mr. Busby, this first question to you. What are your credentials to be a property appraiser? Specifically, do you have a license or certification? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I've worked with the property appraiser's office for the last 15 and a half years. I've also been a licensed in the state of Florida as a certified appraiser for over 23 years. 
I've done both appraisals in the um, public and private sector. All right, thank you. Ms. Fugate, to you now. Uh, on your credentials, do you have a license or certification? No, ma'am, I do not have a license or a certification, but I have over 30 years of experience in administration, and I've handled the tax role for over 20 years for Okaloosa County. All right, thank you. And finally, that first question to you, Mr. Holguin. Uh, I am certified on the tax collection side. I'm currently with the tax collector's office. I've worked there for 10 years and I've handled everything that's tax related with that office. Um, I uh, currently manage over 65 people and our six branch offices. So my qualifications are, are definitely in the tax department side and um, at the tax collector's office, we work daily and weekly with the property appraiser's office. All right, thank you. We'll address our next question to you first, Ms. Uh, uh, Fugate. Do you have any plans to use modern technology to improve operations in the appraiser's office? And if so, what are some of those technologies? Absolutely. Currently, we are working on um, getting tablets for our field officers that go out in the field to appraise your property. And um, we are also going to be putting in place a new mass appraisal uh, system that we have been advised that we will no longer be supported as of next year. So we will be putting that into place, um, which will be a new Windows-based software that will help our technology. All right, thank you, Mr. Holguin. What are your plans to use modern technologies to improve operations in the appraiser's office? Well, first we've got to get window, windows based in the property appraiser's office and get away from the, the DOS based system they're using now to even think about getting you know, mobile in the field. We've been mobile in the field at the task collector's office for eight years now. And, but one of the main things is gonna bring a lot of services online. Currently we collect over 100 million services online at the task collector's office and I can tell you it's being used. Uh, that way we give the citizens a choice, either come in the office or do business on evenings, weekends, or during the day online. Thank you, Mr. Busby. Your opportunity to talk about the modern technologies you would use to improve the appraiser's office. We certainly want to get mobile in the field and we can do that with our current software right now. Um, also, we would bring some services online. We would, we would start to try to do tangible personal property returns online fairly quickly. All right, thank you. This next question will go to Mr. Holguin first. How would you operate the appraiser's office? Specifically, do you have any changes in mind? I do, and technology we've already touched on. Um, and customer service is a big one also. Uh, it's a passion of mine. I teach that at the uh, tax collector's office now. Um, customer service reaches out just more than the customers that are coming in through your office and through the door every day. We're gonna take the service out. I've got plans to put up mobile offices during our busy times, during homestead times, and uh, workshops possibly quarterly, we can go out and educate the community on exemptions that are out there. Maybe they qualify for them, and if they do, well, we can sign you up right there um, at the workshops that we're holding. Thank you. Mr. Busby, what changes do you have in mind for the appraiser's office? I don't have any large wholesale changes in mind for the property appraiser's office. The property appraiser's office has been run very well over the last few years, but I do have some changes. I believe that we need to reach out to some of the people that that deal with with people buying new homes and make sure that they get the correct information. I've worked with a few of the closing agents and the realtors to do that. I think that's one thing we really need to do. We also need to make sure that we get better information on our website. We have, we have great information in our office. We have a lot of users of that website and we just need to make sure we keep the correct information on that website. All right, thank you. And finally, Ms. Fugate, um, your plans for operating the appraiser's office and any changes you have in mind? Well, actually, I feel every office can um, make some type of changes and our office runs very well. Our customer service gives 110% to our um, citizens of Okaloosa County. I do um, handle the website and we deal with the realtors on a daily basis and we are updating that website now with the new GIS and um, the new aerials. So we, we always have the uh, first technology out there to s take care of our citizens. All right, I think Thank I you. got a little out of order. So I think Ms. Fugate, you get this question first. Uh, no, I'm sorry. 
Uh, we are moving on to question number four, so we're back to Mr. Busby. All right, what, if any, plans do you have to address homestead exemption fraud in the county? Uh, we, we address homestead ex exemption fraud now in our office. Um, we will continue to address that. I think it's very important that for someone that does not deserve that homestead, they do not get it. We, but we also want to make sure that the people that do deserve those exemptions get it as well. Um, we will also use the people that we have out in the field to make sure that we find some of those homestead exemption fraud customers. All right, thank you. And now to you, Ms. Fugate. Uh, what plans, if any, do you have to address homestead exemption fraud in the county? Actually, that's a great question. I formed a fraud department for the Oakleese County Property Appraiser, and we have collected over $3 million. Actually, right now it's right at uh, top and $4 million. And we've served over 2,000 um, homestead liens on fraudulent um, taxpayers. So that is a good thing. And, um, you know, people that don't deserve the exemption, we do need to take ap action because the statute says the property appraiser shall take the action. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holgeen? Yeah, this is an issue that uh, actually I differ with, with uh, the two candidates that's running in the race with me. I think three million is, is way too much. I think that number needs to be lower. I don't think that's a number that we try to raise. And I think we do that and I, uh, through education. Educating the people on, uh, the phone calls I get on the other side are, are the customers that are actually paying these bills. So I get to deal with the customer. My opinion is 80% of those homestead liens are just mistakes that are made. They're not fraud. Fraud's a very strong word. I would say possibly 20% is actually fraud, but the other 80% could be handled through education programs and letting these customers know whether they're just widows or widowers that uh, their partner has always done the paperwork. Let them know ahead of time. All right, thank you. Our final question for you candidates, and it'll go first to Ms. Fugate. Would you support adding more homestead exemptions? Why or why not? I think currently we have um, enough exemptions in our county. Um, the only one that we really don't have adopted is the uh, one where you live 25 years in your home. Um, we serve our community well with exemptions and with the military base, you know, we have over 45,000 parcels that are exempted. So I think we do pretty good on exemptions. All right, thank you. Mr. Holgain. We do have a lot of exemptions. Um, again, educating the public, making sure they are, know the exemptions that are out there. And if one does come up that you agree with, uh, support it. Last November, I went to Tallahassee and supported Senate Bill 160, which is the military bill that if you are uh, stationed or overseas in harm's way or combat zone that you don't pay property taxes during that time. Happy to say that uh, after lobbying and, and speaking to the Finance and Tax Committee that they did pass that and uh, it is law now. So. Uh, we do have a lot of exemptions, but by all means, if you see one that you support, you know, go out there, support it, go to Tallahassee and actually fight for the citizens and your taxpayers. That's who's paying our, our salaries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holgain. And uh, this question finally to you, Mr. Busby, would you support adding more homestead exemptions? I would support adding more homestead exemptions if they were the right exemptions and they reached more people. Um, I don't think we need to select just a few out to give exemptions. I think it needs to be fair across the board. We do have a lot of exemptions now. I think they're very good exemptions, but I would support new ones if they were the right exemptions. All right, thank you. And now it is time for our closing statements and each of our candidates will have 45 seconds for those c closing uh, remarks. And continuing the rotation from our question answer session, Mr. Holgeen, you will get the first shot at closing statements, 45 seconds. Thank you and thank you uh, to everyone that's put this together. Uh, more importantly, thank you to the viewers out there that have tuned in, that wanna get educated on the candidates, find out our platforms and, and Pick who you want to vote for on August 30th. Uh, as your property appraiser, I will bring uh, better customer service, better technology, but more importantly, fair assessments across the board for everybody. It's a reality we all have to pay taxes, but that doesn't mean we have to pay more than our fair share. Again, I'm John Holguin. It's H-O-L-G-U-I-N. 
for or vote for olgaina.com. Please check it out on the website. Uh, my phone number's on there, an email. Reach out to me. I, w I am available. I will get back to you. Uh, and, and most importantly, I, I hope I earned your vote tonight, and I hope I earned your trust. August 30th, please vote. Thank you, Mr. Holgain. Mr. Busby. Yes, uh, thank you again for having us here tonight. It's been an honor. Um, I'm a property appraiser that's running for the Oklahoma County property appraiser. My career is rooted in property appraising, both in the public and the private sector. I believe it's very important that we put a property appraiser in the property appraiser's office. As a, a professional real estate property appraiser, I will be a hand on property appraiser who will not rely solely on other people to understand and perform the vital duties of this office. Duties that touch each and every taxpayer in Okaloosa County every day. So please vote for me, Mac Busby, for Okaloosa County property appraiser. Thank you, Mr. Busby. And finally, you get the last word, Ms. Fugate. Awesome. Thank you for having us here tonight. It was a great pleasure being here. And when you vote for me for Okaloosa County Property Appraiser's Office, you will not have to do on-the-job training. I am fully trained in the administrative process of the Property Appraiser's Office. That is my current job as Administrator, a Director of Administrator. I've handled the tax roll for over 20 years and never had a late tax roll or never had one rejected from the Department of Revenue. I appreciate your vote. August 30th, vote Janet Fugate for property appraiser, and please go to my website, JanetFugate.com. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Fugate, and thank you, candidates. And those were the candidates in the race for Okaloosa County property appraiser. We're taking a short break. When we come back, we'll hear from the candidates for Okaloosa County Superintendent of Schools. Stay with us. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Meadows, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. There is one amendment to the Florida Constitution on the August primary ballot. A 60% margin is required for passage. Here's a brief look at what that amendment covers. Amendment 4, solar devices or renewable energy source devices, exemption from certain taxation and assessment. The ballot summary reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution to authorize the legislature by general law to exempt from ad valorem taxation the assessed value of solar or renewable energy source devices subject to tangible personal property tax and authorize the legislature by general law to prohibit consideration of such devices in assessing the value of real property for ad valorem taxation purposes. This amendment takes effect January 1, 2018 and expires on December 31st, 2037. For more detailed, nonpartisan information, you can access the Florida League Voters Guide. Log on to thefloridavoter.org, the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida. Follow the steps shown on screen in order to obtain the Guide to Florida Amendments. This guide will display a synopsis of the amendment and an explanation of what a yes or no vote will mean. Welcome back. We continue now our questions for candidates in the upcoming primary election on August 30th. Tonight we focused on the contest for Florida Senate District 1. 
Florida House, District 4, and several Okaloosa County races. Next up, the race for Okaloosa County Superintendent of Schools. This is another universal race, meaning it's open to all voters in the county. And there are two candidates for this contest. Both are Republican. And it is time to meet those candidates. Moving alphabetically, the first candidate is the incumbent, Miss Mary Beth Jackson. Her opponent is Miss Marilyn Van Dyke. Thank you both for joining us this, this evening. And it's time now for our questions. There will be a number of questions and you'll both have 45 seconds to respond. We will begin question number one with Miss Jackson. Again, thank you both for joining us tonight. Question number one, in light of the new accounting procedures that project a $75.3 million deficit in the Oklahoma County balance sheet for school pensions, how do you propose to raise funds to cover that shortfall? Well, we have not seen all of that information as of yet. The pension fund is one of those things that we have some control over. We now contribute 3% per employee to that pension fund. I also think the most important thing that we can do is lobby the folks in Tallahassee to get them to work with us to help shore up or put more money into that pension fund. All of us depend on that. Our lives depend on that. Our futures depend on that. And I think that as we move through the next three years or four years, it will become an even more important issue for us. Jackson. Ms. Van Dyke, the question again, in light of the new accounting procedures that project a shortfall, how do you propose to raise funds to cover that shortfall? Uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that will be somewhat out of our control. Um, first, I think knowledge is power and uh, simply informing our, our teachers, our ed support, that this is a problem. Uh, the, the squeaky wheel kind of gets the attention. We have to lobby. We have to go to Tallahassee. Uh, and it's going to take many, many voices to get this job done. Uh, teachers have a tendency to sit back and, um, and not ask for things for themselves. And this is a time when they're going to have to stand up together, united, and, and uh, lobby with legislature to make something happen. Uh, they do contribute. We contribute 3%. It's not enough. They will fall short, and, and together we can do that. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Van Dyke, and we'll begin our next question with you. In light of easing the cost of fees for extracurricular school activities, what are your plans to create a level playing field that permits all children an opportunity to take part? Okay, uh, we absolutely have to create that level playing field. We also have to recognize that people, uh, including our children, our students, have differences, things that they're interested in that other students may not be interested in. So I think offering lots of various opportunities, allowing different areas to um, possibly bring in. I know there's a, there's a large group of people that would like to see lacrosse come into our school system. We have to step back just like uh, school uniforms in some of our schools and some of our high poverty schools. Some of those things and some of those expenses for these extracurricular activities will have to be provided for the students. All right, thanks, Ms. Van Dyke. And just to give a quick reminder to our candidates, when you initially hear a bell, that's your five second warning that your 45 seconds is about to be up. If there's multiple rings, then you know it's time to lock it down. So moving on to our next question, question uh, for Ms. Jackson. How, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead and if you would take that second question for me as well. Yes, in light of uh, easing the cost for fees of extracurricular activities, what are your plans to level that playing field so everybody can take part? Well, one thing we do know is that those extracurricular activities are sometimes the only reason a child will stay in school. If they can be in band, if they can be in a sport, if they can be in a club, they will participate. I watch our clubs and our schools uh, struggle raising money for the things that, that are so expensive. In the last four years, we have uh, put the money back into the music and arts programs. It had been stripped from those programs over the previous few years. And as a result of that, uh, children were having to raise money to get the piano tuned in the chorus room. We have to figure out a way, and it may be through more fundraisers. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. And uh, we begin our next question with you. How would you ensure an equitable distribution of funds among male and female school sports teams as required by Title IX? 
Absolutely. When we started four years ago, that was something that was a bit of a problem for me. Having four boys and one daughter, I saw a few things that I didn't think were quite right. So what we decided to do is I called together our staff and I said, gentlemen, we're going to do our own in-house assessment of this. We do have paperwork that we turn in um, to the state every year to say that we are compliant. But we wanted to do our own program. So as a result of that, we started flag football in Okaloosa County, which has been a fun thing to bring more of our young ladies onto the playing field and giving them as much of an opportunity to participate in those sports as our young men. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Van Dyke, same question for you now. How would you ensure an equitable distribution of funds among male and female school sports teams as required by Title IX? Uh, first of all, we, we need to do a needs assessment and, and really see where uh, the needs are because we have some areas that want more, more sports for some of our female students that actually that particular sport is not there yet. Uh, flag football for the girls was added uh, and that was wonderful, but there needs to be a need, needs assessment. And as far as distributing the, the funds, I believe that some of the money, a portion of the proceeds that come in for every sport needs to go into a central pot, so to speak, because uh, as we all know, football is, is our, our big money maker uh, and, and some of those are gonna have to go into a central pot to be distributed. All right, thank you so much. And we begin our next question with you as well. If elected, do you plan to address adjusting the school start times for high school and middle school students? If so, how? If not, why not? I absolutely do uh, support a later school start time for high school and middle school students. And in, in doing that, I believe that we can make an adjustment that will be somewhat of a minor adjustment by shifting all of the start times slightly later. Uh, so that no one is waiting for the bus when it's dark outside and then um, making sure that we're following the guidelines that we know our professionals have actually provided to us. We have countless, countless studies from uh, physicians, uh, scientists, neurologists, the list goes on and on of why this is important and why we really must do this for our students. So I believe that we have to be cautious with our rural areas all right, thank, thank you, Ms. Van Dyke. And our next question, we start with you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, the same question. If elected, if re-elected, do you plan to address adjusting those school start times for high school and middle school students? We addressed that four years ago. I made a commitment to some folks to really look at that. We brought together a team of about 15 district employees. We devised a way to be able to move that school start time from seven o'clock to between 7.30 and 7.38 with no cost to the district. That was rejected by the later school start time group. And I said, well, we have to be able to buy buses if we're going to move that. So we have put together a team at the direction of the school board. This will include DOT, military, all aspects of our community. We are to do a study during this year and we will present our findings to the school board in May of 2017 with hopefully a change. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Jackson. And we begin our next question with you. More than half of our county schools are over 50 years old in Okaloosa. What are your plans to fund the repair, replacement of aging school infrastructure and expansion to accommodate overcrowding to a new home development? We have dealt with that quite often over the last four years. I'm very well aware that our buildings are very old and it is the infrastructure that we have to worry about, the plumbing, the electrical, the air conditioning, extremely expensive to replace. There are only a few options out there for us. All the counties around us have a sales tax and that can provide for us the capital dollars that we need to repair and replace things in the schools. If we could get a half cent sales tax passed in this county for five years, that would generate $12 million a year in revenue. We would be able to fix the roof at Choctahatchee High School and replace the air conditioning system at Fort Walton Beach High School. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. And Ms. Van Dyke, same question to you again. So many schools aging in need of repair, replacement due to aging infrastructure and expansion to, to accommodate uh, growth in the area. What would your plans be to address that? Absolutely, we simply do not have the funds 
to uh, do the repairs that are necessary and to do the additional building that is necessary at this moment in time. I would fully support a sales tax, but with that sales tax, we must put in a sunset clause. It would have a start and a stop time, and we would have a list of exactly which projects would be, and the, the list would be prioritized. We'd have an agency that would come in to do the evaluations, prioritizing the list. Obviously, roofs and plumbing are gonna have to come first on our list, and then going on to make sure that each of our schools have the same, um, as, as close to the same facility, safety, and uh, presence as possible. All right, thank you, Ms. Van Dyke. And we'll begin our next question with you. Some county school buses run nearly empty while others are apparently pretty overcrowded. What is your plan to improve school transportation safety to include hiring and retaining qualified bus drivers? We actually have a, a software program that the district purchased uh, some time ago. That software program is the answer to, to our problems. As far as the, the busing, the routes are concerned, it gets very complicated uh, to try to make sure that our students who have to have door-to-door -door pickup and those who uh, don't have door-to-door -door but they've moved in different areas have um, a stop that might end up being an, an area that no longer has enough students at that stop to, um, to warrant a bus stopping there. The software can take hours and hours and hours of human time, put that all together and spit it out for us of, of what's the, the best approach to uh, the routes. All right, thank you, Ms. Van Dyke. All right, Ms. Jackson, same question to you. Uh, what are your plans to address bus safety if it, it comes to overcrowding or some are empty, uh, including hiring and retaining qualified bus drivers? That's a two-part question. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did purchase that software. We realized that the manual calculation of school bus routes was not as efficient as the new software that was out there. So we purchased that software. We've spent a year doing all of the data entry, putting in all the geo codes. We are now this year going to test that software to see okay, did it work better? Did it work well? Are we able to pick our children up? Hopefully, in doing that, we will be able to be more efficient, but quite frankly, we run a three-tier bus system, which means our buses run three routes every morning and three routes every afternoon. But I will say, the retaining and hiring of bus drivers is a money issue, and we are going to have to look at that. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. And our last question, we'll start with you. Can you speak to the exodus among our current teacher population in Oklahoma County and plans to hire and retain qualified replacements? We are very excited in our county. We are number eight in the state in average salary. Our average age teacher, our average teacher time in our school is 15 years. We do a very good job retaining our teachers. The problem is our colleges and universities are not producing teachers like they once produced those teachers. We have the opportunity to work with our colleges, and we do work with Northwest Florida State College, excellent, excellent teacher training program there. But I can say right now today, we have a teacher shortage in some critical areas. Our ESE populations, our higher order math and science courses, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jackson, yes. All right, Ms. Van Dyke, that last question now to you. Can you speak to the exodus of the current teacher population plans to hire and retain qualified replacements? Yes, ma'am. We unfortunately have seen in the last two to three years more first and second year teachers leaving Okaloosa County Schools than in the history of Okaloosa County Schools. Uh, that exodus is, is huge and it's drastic. Uh, it has a huge impact on a variety. Uh, and then it comes down to dollars and student success as well. To retain the teachers, the very first thing that we have to do is recognize them, appreciate them, let them know that we appreciate the job they're doing. We have to take some of the workload, the paperwork load off of them and give them the power and the tools to teach the students and develop the relationships with those students. All right, thank you, Ms. Van Dyke. And thank you both candidates for answering those question and answer sessions. It is time now for closing remarks and you will each have 45 seconds to deliver a closing statement. And since we began with Ms. Jackson, we will now begin with Ms. Van Dyke for closing remarks. You have 45 seconds. Okay. 
Thank you so much for having us here this evening. And I do want to ask for you all to come out and vote. This is a primary election vote. We have to have every single person voting, casting your wishes. And as your superintendent of schools, I can promise you that I will take the over abundance of money that we're spending now in our curricular in our district office and put that money using site-based management back into the schools empower our principals empower our teachers put the money back where the children are I will listen to the people I will have an open door policy I will be accessible for you and again I ask that you come out and vote Van Dyke Thank you so much, Ms. Van Dyke. Ms. Jackson, you have 45 seconds. Thank you. I believe the best judge of a person is what they've done, not what they say they'll do. In the last four years, we've moved academically from number 11 to number two in the state. We've put 94 cents of each dollar into the schools, more money to the schools than has been there in 15 years. We've decreased out of school suspension by 80%. I don't believe children should be suspended out of school. We've managed very well. In fact, the district administrative office under our administration has the lowest average number of administrators in any time in the last 15 years. We have 62.0, 64 the previous, and then 65 the previous before that. We are getting it done for less. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Again, that was the race for Okaloosa County Superintendent of Schools. We are taking a short break. When we come back, the last races of the night, Okaloosa County School Board Districts 2 and 4. Sandra and I will begin those questions when we come back. Stay with us. Thanks for watching this year's rally event on WSRE TV. I am Haley Richards. Ellen Rossin and I serve as co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area. For nearly 30 years, the leagues here and in Okaloosa County have provided questions for events like tonight's forum as a service to our local communities. Our democracy is based on active participation by informed citizens, and voting is an important way to participate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we don't support or oppose parties or candidates. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and encourage informed and active participation in government. This rally is one way for us to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. You can also contact us for explanations of amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to attend our public events or join us as members of the League. For more information, visit lwvpba.org or lwvokaloosa.org. And please remember to be an informed voter this year. Scambia County by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on Election Day. To vote by mail, contact the Escambia County Supervisor of Elections Office. You can write, phone, fax, email, log on to their website, or ask in person at the Supervisor's Office on Powell Fox Place in downtown Pensacola. Ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections Office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. Early voting takes place from Saturday, August 20th through Saturday, August 27th at the seven locations listed on your screen. Early voting times are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at the Supervisor of Elections Office and from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. at all other locations. On the day of the primary election, Tuesday, August 30th, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. To verify your precinct, log on to escambiavotes.com. Be sure to bring photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to WSRE's Rally 2016. Thank you again for joining us tonight. This is the second of three nights as we focus on the candidates who are running for office in the August 30th primary election. Let's go ahead and get started with the last races of the night. 
and they are the contest for Okaloosa School Board Districts 2 and 4. Both races are nonpartisan and open to all registered voters in Okaloosa County. The seats are also elected at large and accordingly the questions are identical for both races and we will be interviewing the candidates for both districts together. And these races will also be decided on the primary election day and since there are two candidates in each race, someone will get the 50% plus one majority needed to win. Now let's meet the candidates in the race for Okaloosa County School Board District 4 in alphabetical order. They are Mr. Tim Bryant and our second candidate in District 4, Mr. Charles Cawthon. And in the race for Okaloosa School Board District 2, the first candidate is incumbent Mr. Dewey E. Destin and his challenger is Mr. Mark Williams. Thank you all for being with us tonight and we will ask each of you a number of questions and you'll have 45 seconds to answer. We'll question you again in alphabetical order beginning with Mr. Bryant. And Mr. Bryant will give that question to you. According to the Northwest Florida Daily News, the Tri-County area has nearly 2,400 homeless students. What is your plan to ensure their attendance and graduation and advocate for adequate shelter for them? Well, you know, homeless is a, is a big issue in every county that's in, in the United States. And I think as a community, we need to come together and we need to uh, find those uh, people and get them into the schools. Uh, there's numerous ways through uh, different private agencies that we can do it. Uh, also through the school district, uh, we can uh, identify those uh, students and get them in there. Uh, it's going to take a community uh, to get us together and find those students and uh, ensure that they get the quality public education that's due them even though they might be homeless. All right, thank you. Now to you, Mr. Cawthon. The Tri-County area has ne nearly 2,400 homeless students. What is your plan to ensure their attendance and graduation and to advocate for adequate shelter to serve them? I actually worked in this capacity as the district attendance officer for a number of years and I worked with under over 400 judicial cases involving students who were not attending school and five different judges. It's important to get into the schools and be accessible to the parents, find out what's going on in that family, work with them through our other agencies that we have within the school district and get them back on track. They are struggling often, uh, of course, as you said, economically, so we need to get all the support that we can to these students and understand and just specifically what problems they're facing with them and work with our guidance counselors and other school specialists to get them back into school and on track. Thank you, Mr. Cawthon. Now to you, Mr. Destin. Uh, what is your plan to ensure the attendance and graduation of the many homeless students in the county or in the area? And how would you advocate for adequate shelter to serve them? Well, we do have a number of programs that <coughs> address those homeless children. We uh, we try to track how they attend school through our guidance and attendance people. Um, and we have subsidized lunches, so we track them on that program. But even more important than getting them to graduate, we want them to participate in the system and become academically excellent. And we can do that by instituting some programs that find these kids in the pre-K to first uh, to third grade and give them the extra help that they have been denied because of their economic status and we want to advocate that during uh, my next term. I've read about some of these programs that are used up north and that are quite effective. All right, thank you. And finally to you, Mr. Williams, your plan for advocating for attendance and graduation and adequate shelter for the homeless students in the area. Homelessness for a family has to be one of the saddest things that parents can endure to not know where their children are going to lay their head at night and not know where they're going to have shelter when it's cold. Uh, it's, it's a sad situation. I've never been homeless, but I have been. I did grow up in poverty and uh, I know what it is to uh, live on a meager uh, income. Look, the, there are social programs in the cities and the counties. That's what the whole community has to wrap themselves around to help these families. There are free food programs in the schools and even something as, uh, as, as straightforward as the uh, school choice program and the opportunity scholarships in the state of Florida where rich people could always take their children to a private school, but now poor people can go to a private school by using these vouchers to take them there. In fact, they're doing much more of that these days. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we begin our next question with you, Mr. Cawthon. If the newly revised policy on prayer at school board meetings is legally challenged, how would you respond? Well, 
personally, I am in favor of prayer, but at the school board meetings, we need to realize that if we open this, the prayer up at the school board meeting, it will have to remain open to all religious entities and that could present a problem. I am in favor of continuing just as we have in the classroom with a moment of silence so that each individual at the meetings may recognize their own faith and I do believe we need to continue with a moment of silence as we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cawthorn. Mr. Destin, if it's legally challenged, the newly revised policy on prayer at school board meetings, how would you respond? Well, in fact, we worked with a, a group called Liberty Council to uh, draw up our new plan. And we also researched extensively federal law. Liberty, <clears throat> the Liberty Council said that, that uh, as, as long as they helped us write the law to follow federal guidelines as closely as possible, that they would def defend our uh, new policy pro bono. So if in fact we are challenged, I, I expect that we will uh, have their full support. And as I said earlier, we wrote that as close as we could to the guidelines that the federal court system has uh, put out in the last few years. And we believe that we meet the uh, court's mandate. All right, thank you, Mr. Destin. Mr. Williams? As I've walked around Okaloosa County and talked to voters, maybe the single greatest issue that they talk about is the erosion of Christian values in our school system. It, it, it's saddening. Uh, and for a federation like the Freedom From Religion Foundation to come in and really with their deep pockets bully the school system into uh, changing the Christian prayer they were doing at the opening, I, I think is wrong for them. I don't fault any of the school board members. What I would do is I would offer my own personal Christian prayer at the beginning, before the beginning of the meeting, and anyone that wanted to join in would be welcome to join in. But I would also move as soon as I get on the school board to repeal the multi-faith prayer because of the problems we've seen here in Pensacola. I don't want to go through that mess uh, in our school board. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. And Mr. Bryant. Well, you know, the original intent of, of the uh, school board led prayer was exactly that, the, uh, a school board member led prayer. Uh, I went to many of school board meetings and the prayer lasted maybe 15 seconds. Now you get this group in that's going to bully the school board, not just our school board, but you know, other government agencies throughout the panhandle. And now what's happened is that it's not a school board led prayer, it's, it's a multi-faith prayer. And I would also say that that's gonna cause a lot of issues uh, and disrupt what the meeting is about. Uh, as a Christian, I would go in before and say my prayer and ask the Lord to, you know, to guide me. But it, the original intent was that it was a school board led prayer and it's not that no more. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Bryant. All right, time now for question number three, and it goes first to Mr. Destin. How would you ensure an equitable distribution of funds among male and female sports teams as required by Title IX? Well, we believe we're in full compliance with Title IX, and we, we keep a pretty sharp eye on that. But uh, <clears throat> we, as Ms. Jackson spoke earlier, we have tag football for, for uh, all male and female. Our swimming sports are all co-ed. Uh, we have, have made an extra effort to make sure that we offset the uh, predominantly male football games with, with other sports that uh, include both male and female. And uh, we keep track of that pretty closely because Title IX is pretty serious and they, and they watch us pretty closely. All right, thank you. Mr. Williams, that question to you. How would you ensure an equitable distribution of funds among male and female sports teams as required by Title IX? Title IX make, ensures we don't discriminate based on sex. So we're gonna, they have, and as I understand it, they, as Mr. Destin said, they have the appropriate number of sports. The sports aren't attended to or maybe uh, followed with the same vigor. Certainly there isn't the same investment. The school football programs have a tremendous investment in there. They get a lot of attention. I do think it, there's some attention needs to be paid to which sports programs we're offering for the females and, and how much backing we're putting, how much investment we're making. All right, thank you. To you, Mr. Bryant, uh, Title IX compliance within the district. Well, again, Title IX is, is, is something that we have to follow, and I believe the school district's done a good job of, of ensuring that all uh, female and male students uh, get an adequate number of uh, uh, athletics uh, available to them. Uh, as far as the funding that goes to them, uh, of course, football is what 
funds most of the athletic programs. My son plays soccer and we depend on football games to help fund, uh, fund our uh, soccer team. So, you know, we need to look at ways that we can uh, uh, help ensure that all the money that comes from one major sport is uh, diversified to all the other sports. And I think as parents, we need to come together with the schools and figure out uh, a way to make it easier for us. All right, thank you. And finally to you, Mr. Cawthon. Working in the past in the Department of Health, Athletics, Attendance and Discipline, I have close uh, conversations with and on frequent occasions with our guidance counselors and also our athletic directors and our district level athletic director, making sure that they were having contact with the guidance counselors and teachers and everyone in the schools if there were any complaints coming through from the students and also making sure that we were accessible to the parents when these meetings mm -hmm. through the athletic directors within each school. Accessibility is the key to the students, the parents, the community to make sure that we are in compliance. All right, thank you. And we'll hear more from our candidates in just a bit. We're taking a short break right now and we'll wrap up our questions and begin closing statements when we return. Thank you for joining us for WSRE's Rally 2016. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on election day. Good evening, I am Ed Meadows, president of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally, a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. There is one amendment to the Florida Constitution on the August primary ballot. A 60% margin is required for passage. Here's a brief look at what that amendment covers. Amendment 4, solar devices or renewable energy source devices, exemption from certain taxation and assessment. The ballot summary reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution to authorize the legislature by general law to exempt from ad valorem taxation the assessed value of solar or renewable energy source devices subject to tangible personal property tax and authorize the legislature by general law to prohibit consideration of such devices in assessing the value of real property for ad valorem taxation purposes. This amendment takes effect January 1, 2018 and expires on December 31st, 2037. For more detailed, nonpartisan information, you can access the Florida League Voters Guide. Log on to thefloridavoter.org, the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida. Follow the steps shown on screen in order to obtain the Guide to Florida Amendments. This guide will display a synopsis of the amendment and an explanation of what a yes or no vote will mean. All right, welcome back. We are wrapping up our question and answer session with the candidates for Okaloosa County School Board Districts 2 and 4. Again, this is a nonpartisan race and the seats are elected at large. The questions are identical for both races and we are interviewing the candidates together. Mr. Williams, is, uh, it is your turn to take the next question first and Molly? That's right, we begin with question number four. Can you speak to the exodus among our current teacher population? Specifically, how would you propose hiring and retaining qualified replacements? There's a significant erosion of teachers in the school system, significant turnover each year. And I think the biggest problem is, is that we don't treat our teachers with, with great value. I've, I've campaigned on treating our teachers as our greatest asset. Look, here, here's what's really important. Teachers inspire students every day, and we have to do more to value those teachers. That greatest asset gets up and walks out of school every day on two feet. We have to do more to get them to want to walk back in the door the next morning. 
I, I suggest less overwork, or, or, uh, respect the teacher in the classroom, uh, do, a, a, do a survey, a countywide uh, anonymous survey needs to be done of the entire school system annually. Uh, and you know, let's get feedback and let's reward the teachers. The A-plus school bonus money, let's put it to teachers and staff where it needs to go. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Bryant, that question now to you. Can you speak to the exodus among our current teacher population and specifically what you would do, how you would address hiring and retaining qualified replacements? Well, it's something that in Okaloosa County has not become a big problem yet, but it is a nationwide problem and it is slowly coming to Okaloosa County and it's something we're going to have to address over the next four years. Uh, Okaloosa County is a, a, a heavily military county, so some of our exodus is because of military, but a lot of it is because teachers are just fed up. They don't they don't enjoy teaching anymore. And as a school board member, you know, we are gonna to have to bring our community together and hold our elected officials in Tallahassee more accountable so we can take the burden off of our teachers and give them the ability to teach again. Let's face it, the teachers that are in there now, they love their job, but they hate the uh, red tape that goes with it. And, uh, you know, we need to lift the burden off of them. All right, thank you, Mr. Bryant. Mr. Cawthorn. How would you propose hiring and retaining qualified replacements for teachers in Okaloosa County? Having worked in nine elementary schools, six middle schools, four high schools, and one K through 12, I have a comprehensive background in working with teachers at each level. The main thing they want is respect, just like in any profession. We treat them as professionals. We give them all the support that we can. We give them encouragement and we compensate them as they should be. Okaloosa schools are, are an, an A school district and la this last year and have been for many years. So let's give them the respect and the compensation that they deserve and the encouragement and reduce the paperwork. That's what I keep hearing from our surveys. Teachers saying we're, we're burdened with too much testing. We need more instructional time and we need to get away from having to do so much documentation. All right, thank you, Mr. Cawthon. Mr. Destin. All four of us have come up with the same conclusion that we need to teach our teachers, and we need to treat our teachers with respect. We in fact did the survey anonymously last July. Uh, we got 357 responses from the teachers and over 60 pages of suggestions. I've read through those. The number one uh, complaint that they had was the paperwork. They need to have, uh, they need to have secretaries. We have done our best over the last year to act on those suggestions. We've I'm sorry, did I, over, did I go over? Okay. No, you were fine. That was a different one. Okay, okay. We, we have reduced the paperwork. The uh, lesson plans are due much less now. We have uh, reduced some of the mandated uh, exams and, and, and the mandates that we get from the state that causes all this paperwork. All right, thank you, Mr. Destin. Mr. Williams, I believe you had a rebuttal. Mr. Destin mentions a teacher survey. Uh, it was not anonymous. Uh, from what I've been told, about 350 teachers responded. I've talked to dozens of teachers who never saw it, so it was not countywide. Uh, and it certainly has not been an annual survey. If they did it, they did it one time. Uh, in fact, it was anonymous. Uh, and it, every teacher that I've spoken to was aware of it. Um, and we had 357 uh, res respondents, which is uh, quite a good statistic number and uh, we do plan to do it every year and we did it July of 2015. All right, thank you gentlemen. Turning now to the next question. All right, question number five, we'll go to Mr. Bryant first. How would you address the lack of technology such as computer hardware and Wi-Fi in some of our Okaloosa County schools? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with over the years, uh, they, the school district had site-based management and uh, the money that comes to the schools, you had some schools like Niceville that would get a lot of money and then you had schools like Laurel Hill that didn't get any money. Since the uh, district implemented the central, uh, the, the central uh, site-based uh, budgeting, uh, more money is getting distributed to, to those schools that lack the uh, technology, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, there's still a lot of work to go. Uh, I think over the next couple of years, you're going to see more money going to the schools that uh, that don't get the money uh, in the past, and you'll see technology growing in those schools. Uh, we also need to work partnerships with uh, the outside community too that are uh, business minded. All right, thank you, Mr. Bryant. Mr. Cawthon, to you, how would you address the lack of technology in some of our county schools? 
Well, the big part of the problem with technology is it changes so fast and to stay abreast and on top of the cutting edge with technology. But at this time, we have about a, a two to one ratio, that being students who one out of two who do have uh, computers that they are have immediate access to. And th those are at the higher level at the high school. Uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to work with our business partnerships and come up with ways and ideas to increase our technology. Thank you. Mr. Destin. In fact, we have made improvements in our Wi-Fi and our technology uh, repeatedly over the last few years. We now lease our computer equipment and our, and our, and our support and they, there's a refresh clause in the contract in which they refresh the, the devices every three years, I believe. So we're making some great strides and we do have, uh, we're very close to meeting the mandate, state mandate that we have one device for one student. Uh, we're now at uh, one device for every two, so we're making great progress on it and uh, we will continue to upgrade as we go along. Thank you. And finally, to you, Mr. Williams, your plans for addressing the lack of technology in some of our Okaloosa schools. No one on the current school board has the technology experience that I do. I, was, I led information technology globally for a Fortune 500 company. Look, uh, Mr. Destin says they're headed towards one to one. I heard the superintendent said, say two to one was good enough. Half a computer per each student doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, they also need broader bandwidth, higher speed internet, and we need to move more to a digital classroom. Most of the school books are online already. You know, when I go to Vieira, Florida, and I sit down with my grandson and read him his uh, stories at night, I, put, I pick up his school iPad, he looks up the stories, uh, he reads them, he takes a test, and he submits it all online. Now, no dog can eat that homework. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, and our final question of the night, Mr. Cawthorn, we begin with you. For students who do not plan to continue to go on to college, how can we best prepare them to join the workforce? We have a choice program in our school district in which we try, we, there's, it's, in the past has been referred to as our VOTEC program. It's an excellent program. It's also offered to young adults who are also out of the, our school district. And we must continue with this program. We might, we might even be able to do this through magnet schools dispersed throughout the, the district, which might help with our growing uh, process of uh, needs for schools where we need to expand. And uh, we have to stay in touch with our guidance counselors, the administrators, and the parents to get them in to make sure that we've got them on the right track so that they are confident and successful in their in educational endeavors. All right, thank you, Mr. Cawthorn. Mr. Destin, for students who don't plan to go to college, how do we prepare them for the workforce? Well, we do have our choice school, which is uh, specialized in that. But in addition to that, <clears throat> we've tried to spread it out to our other schools. We have a biomedical program at Fort Walton Beach High School that teaches kids to be prepared to enter into the medical profession. We just won a statewide award for that program. Over at Choctahatchee High School, we have a drone program that uh, teaches kids to operate uh, drones, which is an up and coming uh, technology. And in fact, we won our girls drone team, won number one in the state of Florida and number three in the United States. So we are trying to get those uh, choices to put people on down the career path spread out, not only to our, our choice school, but to the other schools in the system. All right, thank you, Mr. Destin. Mr. Williams? I started picking tomatoes at 13 years old and I graduated from there to farms and factories and construction jobs as a teenager. I know what it's like to have to work with, uh, without skill. Um, I, for me, to put, to put people through to jobs, we need to start looking at more choice, like things like a, a commercial driver's license would be key. Uh, more associations, the Future Farmers of America and ROTC, two of the biggest, biggest employers in the nation. Uh, and, and certainly more, more uh, jobs out there where we look for how we can place these students in better jobs. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Bryant. Well, first of all, as the only candidate here that only has a high school diploma, I'm very proud of my career choice, but I also see out there that, uh, that there's children that we expect them to go to college and they're not, they're not college material. So we need to offer the programs that we have now choice and expand it even more. Uh, there's so many opportunities out there for children that uh, we, we haven't even untapped yet. And I think if we, uh, uh, invest our money more into the choice programs. You know, 67% of these kids are gonna go right out into the workforce and we need to prepare them for that. And uh, I think we have a wonderful program with choice, but we need to expand it more. 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. And thank you, gentlemen, for participating in that question and answer session. It's time now for closing statements. You will each have 45 seconds. And Mr. Destin, it is your turn in the rotation. We will begin with you for closing remarks. You have 45 seconds. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. We have one of the top rated school districts in the state of Florida. Out of 67, we're in the top three. We're one of only three in the state that are rated as A schools. In some areas, we're rated number one. We have the highest ACT scores cumulative in the state. We've done all this with one of the lowest tax rates in the state. We, uh, we have done more with less. Uh, many of our programs are models for the rest of the state. In fact, our, our uh, resource officer program where we have a, an armed deputy in every school has been looked at by districts all over the state. Uh, please uh, vote for Dewey Destin and we'll keep up uh, our excellence. All right, thank you, Mr. Destin. Thank you, and next to Mr. Williams, 45 seconds for your closing statement. Why vote for me? My business, engineering, uh, construction, and experience as an Air Force veteran are exactly the skills that are needed on our school board today. Second, uh, this school board has not been an effective watchdog for the public. From the lack of criminal background checks that, have, were, that weren't conducted on school employees to the excessive piling on of standardized testing. Now these school board members are all good people, but you need the right experience on your board. Third, I care about education. One of eight children raised in Northwest Florida by a devout Christian mother uh, in, in poverty and uh, without education, I know what it's like to have to work for a job. Uh, please vote for Mark Williams for school board because our students' futures are just too important to continue. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Bryant, 45 seconds. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having us here tonight, and I humbly come to you tonight to ask for your vote on August 30th. Uh, as a parent, a business leader, a community leader in our in, in Okaloosa County, I have seen the firsthand effects of how wonderful of a school district that we have. But it's only been as good because we've been involved as parents and we have had an active say in what goes on in, in our child's education. As your school board member, I feel it's important that we bring the community, the business community uh, together with our educators and let's work to solve problems. Uh, you know, you've heard along the way the last couple of years, uh, you know, that we have issues with infrastructure. We need to address those issues and stop kicking the can down the bucket. So on August 30th, please, I ask for your vote. Thank you. And now the final word goes to Mr. Cawthon. You have 45 seconds for your closing statement. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. For 37 years, I've served this school district, 10 years as a teacher, 15 years in school-based administration, and 12 years in the district office. I've worked with tw in 20 A schools. That is a district record. I only missed one full week of work in 37 years and a total of 34 days. That's because I love my job. I came to my job. I love the students. I love this district. I earned five degrees in education, including a doctorate in education management. The school board manages the district. I ask for your vote on August the 30th. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. And again, those were the candidates for Okaloosa County School Board Districts 2 and 4. And thank you so much for joining us and tuning in. There is, of course, one more night to go. Yes, there is one more night. Thursday, we will turn our attentions to local races in Escambia County, including Escambia County Commission Districts 1 and 5. And we'll also meet the candidates for Escambia County Tax Collector, School Board District 1, and Escambia County Sheriff. And that's a wrap for this night's edition of Rally 2016. Our thanks to the League of Women Voters, Okaloosa County and Pensacola Bay Area for their participation in Rally 2016. And our thanks to Pensacola State College and a reminder that Rally will be available shortly for viewing online. You can find it at WSRE.org. Thank you again for being with us tonight and please join us again Thursday night for more of Rally 2016 right here on WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Have a great night.
Thank you.